So here's the family. Those are my sisters. That's me, number three on top. Uh, my oldest sister is Nora on the left. My sister across from her, that's Delia. And Amy. And we're all, as I say, writers. Uh, but the person I think that is responsible for the Efren girls being writers was my mother. And so there they are, Phoebe and Henry Efren. Her name was Phoebe Walkind Efren. Uh, she grew up in um, the Bronx. My father grew up in Brooklyn. They were both uh, children of Russian immigrants. They didn't have, he had four brothers and he was the youngest. He was the one they sent to college. So uh, he was the kind of chosen kid. But my mother, was an amazing person. She was beautiful, you can see that. She cracked wise like Dorothy Parker. I think she looked a little like Katherine Hepburn. And in her early 20s, she was uh, living in New York City. She had grown up there, she was living there. She was secretary to a big Broadway producer, which was a big deal then, since they say secretary, but you know, it was really running the office and, and it was a big job. My dad had been thrown out of that school that my, my grandparents scrimped and saved to send him to. He was thrown out in his senior year for stealing books, badly. <laughs> and he, uh, so he went, to, he went to Broadway because when he was at Cornell, one of the things Cornell has is a great amateur theater program. And he got really bitten by the urge to act, to direct, to produce, to just be on stage or involved with the stage. So he came to Broadway and he talked his way into a job as a stage manager and he worked for Broadway legends like Kaufman and Hart. And at night he would go back to his parents' apartment where he still lived and write. And he churned out play after play after play that nobody wanted to produce. And then he met my mother. And my mother, as I say, was this beautiful, glamorous woman who worked for a Broadway producer. And he fell in love with her. And I think she fell in love with him. And they got married. But it was the Depression. And so after they got married, they had to move in with my grandparents, who lived on 110th Street between Broadway and Amsterdam, up in the Columbia University uh, area in a two-bedroom apartment, and I think there were other relatives living in the apartment, too. It was a crazy time where people, there just wasn't a lot of housing. And my mother in 1941 had a first baby, and when she got pregnant, what happened to women then who were working was all of a sudden they lost their jobs. And so just like that, she went from being a hot shot on Broadway to walk in a baby carriage up and down Riverside Park. And if you knew my mother, this would not be a happy event for her, even though uh, she certainly loved my sister Nora. Uh, so there she is in this crowded apartment with my in-laws, her in-laws, no, her, her grandparents. And my father was actually very smart. He convinced her not to go back to work. He said, let's write a play together because he'd been struggling to write one. So, and I'm sure he said something like, hey, I, I, you know, I, I, I've, got, I've, got, I've got connections and, and you can type. <laughs> and they did, they wrote a play. What they needed was a great idea and my mother came up with it. So the idea was an unhappy mother with a brand new baby moves in with her parents in a cramped New York City apartment, crowded with crazy relatives, she arrives alone and in tears with a baby carriage, with diapers. The baby cries, the mother cries, the maid quits. Apparently they had maids in two bedroom apartments in New York City then. And they wrote a three act farce called Three's a Family. And miraculously, it played on Broadway. They got funding. It played for 1943, it played for 497 performances. My mother was 29. And meanwhile, she's taking care of the baby. And what does she name my sister but Nora? And very deliberately, after 
Anybody want to guess? What? Uh, in the doll's house, exactly. And uh, one of my father's best friends was Julie Epstein and his twin brother, who had written Casablanca. As you know, a very big hit. And he helped them get jobs at 20th Century Fox. So they, they uh, with about you know, 10 cents in their pockets after they got rid of everything in New York and moved to LA, they hopped on the, um, the train. You did not travel in those days by airline. They hopped on the Super Chief and came to a Union Station in uh, Los Angeles and moved to Beverly Hills. So there she is at 20th Century Fox. She's now got an office. She's got a secretary. She and my father shared an office. Uh, and they went on to write movies like The Desk Set with Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, Carousel, the uh, the movie adaptation was uh, based on a, uh, a Broadway play, Lilium, and then Carousel. We, they bought a house on Linden Drive in Beverly Hills, if you know Beverly Hills, uh, between Santa Monica and Sunset, so not, uh, not up in the really wealthy part, but not down in the, in the apartment areas either. And I wish I could tell you that um, there was a happy ending to my mother's story, but there was not. Um, she died uh, at the age of 56. I was 23, and she died of cirrhosis. So you know she was an alcoholic. She was very talented, very smart, very beautiful, and very unhappy. And you know, it's hard to even imagine what went wrong because look at, I mean, they had so much. And yet things, it was a crazy house to grow up in. There was a lot of yelling and screaming and fighting and it was a, a tough house for a child. The upside was they had enough money for help. We had fabulous help. So if I came home, there was somebody home who was not drunk. There was somebody home who had made cookies. There was a sense that I could go home, and somewhere in that house it would be safe. So I feel like I got saved by two things. One is, as crazy as my mother and father were, they completely adored us and made us feel like we were the smartest, the cutest, the, you know, just the funniest, the most delightful people that had ever walked the face of the earth. And that made a huge difference in... Uh, in how we were brought up. The other thing that my mother did is she filled the house with books. Books, 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 books. And I mean, the downside was I'm actually really good in math and science, and I was not encouraged in that direction in the slightest. Um, however, you know, from when we were very young, we read books, and the books were books with female heroes, you know, which was not that easy to find for kids in those days. But you know, The Wizard of Oz with Dorothy Gale and Eloise who makes the Plaza Hotel into her playground, and uh, uh, the, uh, the Little Princess. Uh, so there were a lot of wonderful books in the house, and we were read to, and we read. It was really wall-to-wall -wall books. Um, when my mother was dying, um, she was in New York Hospital, and she knew she was dying. We all knew she was dying. and. My sister Nora went to visit her, and she said to my sister Nora something she never would have said to me. She said, you're a writer. Take notes. It's a really tough thing to say. She was, she was not someone you would go to for sympathy, right? She was tough. But it was excellent advice, and I always think a dysfunctional family for a writer is the gift that keeps giving. Because as I write, I keep going back to pain and unhappiness and things that were not good. And the struggle, the humor in that too, is interesting. It gives books grist as opposed to just this happened, and then this happened, and this happened. So I, I feel in a way that both her saying take notes gives me permission 
to write about her, although I don't write about her. I haven't written anything. I wrote a piece for Oprah O Magazine that you can find on my website. I have a link to it about my mother. But, uh, but otherwise, all of my work is fictional. So I'm sort of triangulating. You know, they tell actors and actresses when you're doing a scene and you're supposed to be upset about something, you find some time in your life where you had that feeling and you go there. And then you act out the scene, which is a completely different situation, but you're channeling those feelings and those emotions. And so I feel like I'm always going back to what it was like uh, growing up there. So, I mean, Nora certainly wrote a lot about her own life. She wrote Heartburn, which was about her divorce from um, Carl Bernstein. Uh, my sister Delia wrote Hanging Up, which is about my father's death, alcoholism and death. Uh, my sister Amy ha ha has written several books, including one called Bruce Fruit, about growing up in California as a young bride. And we all have, you know, spun, spun those stories for our own uses. Um, I was the one who said I don't write. I did get a haircut. <laughs> I was the one who always said I don't write. I started life as a teacher. When I was little, you know, other kids would say, you know, you say, what do you want to be when you grow up? People would say, oh, an ice skater, a ballerina, a torch song singer. I was a teacher, teacher, teacher from day one, and I love to teach. I still teach a lot. I wrote a book about writing, and I teach a lot at writing workshops, so it's really part of me. Um, but I used it as an excuse to say I don't write. Um, and so it was sometime in my early 40s, my kids were starting to get old enough that they didn't need the little playroom we had in the house. And I uh, got a phone call from a freelance writer who asked if she could write a magazine piece about me. I said, why? She said, well, you're the only one who doesn't write. <laughs> and I said, you know, if anyone's going to write about me not writing, it's going to be me. And I was getting on, so I figured I better get started. And I did what women do when we try to learn something new. I took a class. What do men do? They go in the cave, they shut the door, and whatever it is that they need to learn, they just do it. And then they emerge so many weeks or months later. You know, they figured it out. But women, I think we're like pack animals. We're uh, groupies. We like misery loves company, maybe? I don't know. Anyway, I, uh, I took a lot of classes, and I learned what I didn't know, and I didn't know a lot. The weird thing about writing is that we all read so much, if we're readers. We just think, oh, I can do this. I mean, I, I've been reading all my life. And then you try to do it, and it is it's certainly the hardest thing I ever tried to do. And much more complicated, because great writing is invisible. What makes bad writing bad, you can see right away. But when writing works, what happens is you forget the authors there. You just transport it. You don't see the pulleys. You don't see the strings and levers. So it's very hard when you go and you start to write. So I, I did, I did uh, a lot of uh, pre-work. I wrote a lot of books that didn't get published. I tortured my sister Delia into reading all kinds of terrible first drafts. Um, and eventually, I, uh, that's me about uh, four years ago. And so there's, I think, two or three more books on that pile. Uh, that I've written. <laughs>